Dr. Carlos Arteaga. Dr. Arteaga is the co-director of SABCS. He is also a past president of the AACR and the director of the Harold C. Simmons Comprehensive Cancer Center at UT Southwestern Medical Center. Dr. Arteaga. Uh, thank you, Rachel. Uh, good morning, everybody. It's great to see you. Let's start with the first presentation by Dr. Ian Kropp. Dr. Kropp is Associate Chief of the Division of Breast Oncology at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. The title of his presentation is GS103, Trastuzumab Derustican in subjects with HER2-positive metastatic breast cancer previously treated with TDM1, a phase two multicenter open label study, Destiny Breast01. Dr. Kropp. <coughs> Thank you, Dr. Agiaga. Um, so good morning. Thanks for the opportunity uh, to discuss uh, this phase two trial of trastuzumab deruxican, the Destiny Breast01 study. These are my disclosures. So trastuzumab deruxican is a novel antibody drug conjugate. It consists of a HER2-specific monoclonal antibody with the same amino acid sequence as trastuzumab. It's conjugated to a topoisomerase 1 inhibitor payload via a peptide-based cleavable linker. Now, trastuzumab deruxican has several distinctive features. One is that, as I mentioned, its payload is a potent topoisomerase 1 inhibitor. This is a kind of chemotherapy that's not typically used in HER2-positive breast cancer, so it's less likely that cancers will have developed resistance to this agent. Uh, there are about eight of these payload molecules per antibody, and this is a higher drug-to-antibody ratio than is typically seen with current antibody conjugates. And lastly, the payload is membrane permeable. So this, in preclinical studies, it allows it to diffuse out of the targeted cell and kill neighboring tumor cells regardless of their HER2 expression. This study enrolled patients with centrally confirmed HER2-positive advanced breast cancer. All patients had had prior TDM1. Patients who had significant uh, history of interstitial lung disease were excluded, and patients with stable treated brain metastases were eligible. In part one of the study, which was designed to identify the recommended phase two dose of the drug, uh, patients who had TDM1 resistant advanced cancers were randomized to several, uh, one of several different uh, concentrations of uh, trastuzumab deruxtecan. After review of the safety and efficacy of this part, 5.4 milligrams per kilogram was established as the recommended phase two dose, and an additional 130 patients were treated at that dose in part two of the study. A small cohort of four patients who were intolerant of TDM1 uh, also was included at 5.4 milligrams per kilogram. So this presentation will focus on the protocol-specified analysis of all 184 patients treated at the recommended phase two dose. The primary objective was confirmed response rate by central imaging review, uh, and the data cutoff uh, was August 1st, uh, where about 43 percent of patients are still ongoing. So this was a very heavily pretreated population with a median of six prior lines of therapy in the advanced disease setting. All patients that had prior trastuzumab and TDM1, two-thirds that had prior pertuzumab, and the majority had other HER2-directed therapies as well. So now for the efficacy analysis. The primary endpoint of objective response rate by independent review was 60.9 percent. Six percent were complete responses, 54.9 percent were partial responses. The cl clinical benefit rate at six months was 76 percent. The median duration of response was 14.8 months, and the median time to response was 1.6 months, essentially at the time of the first restaging. The disease control rate was 97 percent. There were less than 2 percent of patients who had progressive disease at time of first restaging, and this uniformity of activity of trastuzumab deruxtecan is reflected in this waterfall plot shown here. We also looked at how the response uh, varied by subgroup, and as you can see in this forest plot, the uh, activity of trastuzumab deruxtecan was relatively consistent across all major subgroups, including those patients who had had prior pertuzumab, where the response rate uh, was about 65 percent. The progression-free survival cap and Meyer curve is shown on the left. The median progression-free survival was 16.4 months. And in the important subgroup uh, of those patients who had had prior brain metastases, the PFS was 18 months. Uh, now, I should point out that this was a small subgroup uh, and the confidence intervals are wide. So on the right side is the overall survival. At this data cutoff, the 
Uh, median follow-up is only 11 months, so the data are immature, and the median overall survival is not yet reached. Now turning to the safety analysis. So 57% of patients had at least one grade three adverse event. 15% uh, of patients discontinued the study drug because of an adverse event, and the most common reason for discontinuation uh, was pneumonitis or interstitial lung disease. So this is a summary of uh, the most common adverse events. Uh, this was similar to what was seen with the phase one study of this agent. Nausea, vomiting, and fatigue were the most common adverse events, but these were all almost, uh, I'm sorry, almost all uh, low grade. Uh, alopecia was seen in 48 percent of patients. Neutropenia was in 35 percent of patients, but febrile neutropenia, uh, which is what's most clinically relevant, uh, was rare, less than 2 percent of patients. So because we knew that interstitial lung disease was a risk of trastuzumab deruxtecan from the phase one study, all patients in this study uh, who had evidence of pulmonary toxicity were adjudicated by a independent expert panel. And this panel identified 25 patients, or 13.6 percent of the population, who had interstitial lung disease that was felt to be drug-related. Uh, 20 of the 25 were low grade, but unfortunately four patients had fatal ILD that was felt to be drug-related. Of the total 25 patients who had had ILD of any grade, the median time to onset was 193 days, or about six months after starting study therapy. Of the 20 patients who had grade two or higher ILD, so that's symptomatic ILD, uh, 13 of them, uh, so just over half, had received steroids as part of their treatment. In the patients who had non-fatal ILD, seven had recovered, two were in the process of recovering at the time of the data cutoff, and 12 either had unknown outcomes or were not followed until resolution. And of the four fatal cases, the onset ranged from 63 to 148 days after starting study therapy. Three of those patients had received uh, steroids as part of the treatment for ILD, and the deaths occurred between 9 and 60 days after their initial ILD diagnosis. So this expert panel, uh, after looking over these data, their advice was for future studies of uh, trastuzumab deruxtecan that patients be monitored closely for symptoms of ILD and that uh, trastuzumab deruxtecan be held and that steroids started uh, as soon as ILD was suspected. So in conclusion, trastuzumab deruxtecan demonstrated a confirmed response rate of 60.9 percent and durable benefit in a very heavily pretreated population. The median progression-free survival was 16.4 months, and the activity seemed relatively consistent across clinical subgroups. The overall safety profile was consistent with what's previously been reported uh, with trastuzumab deruxtecan, uh, where low-grade GI and hematologic toxicities uh, were most common. Uh, but ILD is uh, confirmed as an important risk of trastuzumab deruxtecan. Uh, it can be severe and requires careful monitoring and prompt intervention. So these data demonstrate the potential of trastuzumab deruxtecan to establish a new standard of care for patients with advanced HER2 positive breast cancer. Uh, there are several phase three studies of this agent underway, uh, both in HER2 overexpressing cancers as well as HER2 uh, low uh, expressing cancers. And I'll stop there and happy to take questions. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is now open for questions. Uh, <clears throat> microphone, please. Hi. <clears throat> Excuse me. Neil Osterweil, Neil Osterweil with Oncology Practice. Um, so, uh, Dr. Kropp, you said that uh, topocimerase inhibitors are uh, not commonly used in breast cancer. Um, first of all, why, why is that? And second of all, then why use it? Uh, as the toxic payload here. Yeah, so that, that's an excellent question. And, and you know, I, in, you know, I think there's two parts to that. One is, as I said, that, uh, you know, this is uh, an agent that the cancers generally haven't been exposed to, so there's the hope that this would be non-cross resistant. Um, but in terms of uh, why this hasn't been used already in breast cancers, they, they have toxicity as free drugs. Um, and there has been some activity uh, in clinical trials, but it's been limited. And I think the, the bigger issue was toxicity. The idea here is by conjugating it to the antibody, you're able to specifically deliver high concentrations of the drug directly to the tumor cell, uh, and that helps uh, improve the therapeutic index. And I should point out that this is while a, in the class of toporosomerase 1 inhibitor, this is a uh, different version. It's about 10 times more potent than the, the active metabolite of one of the typically used drugs, arenatecan. So it's the same class, but much more potent. And because of the specific delivery, the hope is that you're able to overcome uh, the resistance that's been seen uh, in, with other drugs. Thank you. Thanks. Good question. Thanks. 
Caroline Howick, ASCO Post. So can, can you put the findings in context with the study, like for instance, Cleopatra, which was such a you know, newsmaker, and we know those patients were alive at 57 months post-treatment. So, you know, is this as good as, better than? I know these patients already received pertuzumab, trastuzumab, but. Right, so I think that that's the key point. I mean, the data with uh, trastuzumab and pertuzumab in the Cleopatra, uh, you know, Cleopatra study were, you know, were, were groundbreaking, as you mentioned, uh, but those were untreated patients. That was first-line disease, and we know that in general, drugs used in the early setting of metastatic disease generally are more effective than later lines of therapy. So that's why these data are uh, so um, compelling, is that this is a very heavily pretreated population um, where, uh, you know, as I said, a median of six prior lines of therapy, so very different population than the Cleopatra data. And to just to put it in context, a progression-free survival of 16 months, response rate of 60 percent, those are roughly double or triple what's typically we've seen in other studies of this third and later line population. So these, these really uh, are quite uh, distinctive in, in how uh, the efficacy is compared to what we would see in typical studies uh, in this population where the median progression-free survival has been in the four to five months range as opposed to 16 months here. So, so if patients got the, the, that doublet to begin with and then they progressed and then they got this, I mean, you're already out now about like eight years or something like that with metastatic breast cancer? If, I mean, if you project it, their data and you Well, use so uh, thanks. I, I, should, I should clarify that. So when they say that the um, overall survival with Cleopatra is, you know, roughly five years, that's in patients who've already received, you know, in that five years, they received multiple different therapies. Oh, I see. Okay. So that's, you know, yeah. their, their okay. cumulative uh, treatment right. Uh, right. duration was, you know, over multiple therapies. Yeah. So this okay. is kind of looking at, uh, you know, patients who are already out four or five years um, mm -hmm. from their original diagnosis. And here, other drugs really haven't been very effective, and that's why you know having new therapies that, that are that are active in this heavily pretreated population is really helpful for for our patients. All right, thank you. There's a question from the phone. Hi, uh, yes, this is from Megan Brooks with Medscape. Could Dr. Artiaga weigh in on his thoughts on the results and potential value of this agent? Well, what I would say, this is a fantastic result. As uh, Dr. Krupp stated, this is in a heavily pretreated population. As do we move this treatment to earlier stages of disease, I think I would expect that its impact to even be greater in these patients. So this is great news for patients with HER2 positive breast cancer. Question? Yeah, Marisa Weiss, breastcancer.org. The pulmonary toxicity is really worrisome. And it, I thought that if the, if the agent, the delivering agent, was so specific to the HER2 receptor, why are we seeing that? And, it, and I would have almost thought that you would have had more cardiac toxicity because they're all, they've received a Herceptin multiple times in various forms where that one might, be, might have been the major significant uh, fatal toxicity. <laughs> Right. No, so I think that's an excellent question. And just to be clear, I didn't show the cardiac toxicity data for the sake of time, but there was no clinically significant cardiac toxicity with this drug. In terms of why the ILD is seen, you know, there is interstitial lung disease seen in uh, many different drugs used in, in HER2-positive breast cancer. Uh, but this, uh, including trastuzumab, including TDM1, including topoisomerase 1 inhibitors, uh, the, the rate has been higher here. Uh, we're not sure exactly why that is. Um, as you pointed out, this drug is designed to specifically deliver the drug uh, to uh, the HER2-positive cancer cells, but it's not perfect. There is HER2 uh, on other cells at lower levels. Um, but why we have this, uh, ish, uh, this particular uh, risk is, is, is unclear, and clearly we need to do more in terms of research to identify those patients who are at risk for getting the most severe cases of ILD and how to mitigate that risk. Um, so there's, there, you know, we, we need to do more. I mean, I, I am encouraged by the fact that our community, you know, we learned how to deal with the cardiac toxicity of trastuzumab that you mentioned. We are now learning how to deal with the uh, immune-related toxicities associated with uh, um, checkpoint inhibitors. And so I think, you know, the community uh, can learn how to better deal with this. But, but clearly more research is needed. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, one last question, please. I'm going to be real quick. This is Marilyn Marchione from the AP. What are we calling this drug? Is it TDXP or <laughs> that other number? Uh, I will have to uh, defer to uh, 
the uh, my the sponsor of, of the study to know exactly how you know I've been using the generic term of trastuzumab deruxtecan, which is certainly a mouthful. Uh, and uh, you know if the drug becomes approved, there will be a brand name, which hopefully will be. Uh, uh, um, easier to say, um, but I think right now I'm using trastuzumab deruxtecan. Yeah. TDXD is also. Um, <laughs> so the original number was DS8201, um, but I think that's going to go away as the um, the official name yep. becomes used. Yeah. 